Howdy, folks, is what I would say if I would continue doing that accent, which I'm not going to do. Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of voice, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to their DMs Guild review. My written and video view series will take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. This video will be reviewing the Western-inspired mini-adventure town called Mud, the Haunted Mine, designed by Benedict Hall. I, I couldn't help myself. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my content, consider using my affiliate links for your online shopping and supporting me via patreon.com slash rogue Watson. I want more Western themed adventures. That is such a cool idea. There are so many tropes and characters and story beats and movies to draw from. It's yes. Give me more Western inspired things that even if they're set in the forgotten realms, you can make that work, and this is a great example of how you can make it work. That being said, I wish it did more of the Western thing and less of kind of a generic dungeon crawl, which is what it ends up being. So I'm a little disappointed because I, <laughs> I maybe I made a mistake in raising my own bar really high because I was so excited to get a Western-themed adventure. I just think that's such a neat idea. And I would love to see more of that, even if it's just basically, you know, Magnificent Seven, Seven Samurai, whatever, like any of those storylines. If it's Tombstone and you're hunting down, you know, rival enemy gang, whatever you're doing, I think is a great idea. Uh, and this one has the beginnings of very cool Western theming with a neat town and enemy gang. And then it just turns into a generic cave dungeon crawl, which is a bummer. This is a relatively short adventure designed for fourth level characters, so solidly uh, later tier one, and uh, serves as kind of an undead cave dungeon, if you can't tell by the subtitle, A Haunted Mine, which is primarily where the adventure takes place. Really, really great design with the kind of, uh, it even has like the official like Western font uh, and this kind of sepia tone parchment paper. All of that looks um, absolutely fantastic and really brings it together and again elevated my excitement for having a western themed adventure I really wanted more from this one uh, it does have a really cool option where if you wanted to run this as a one shot which a lot of short adventures uh, w could be run as a one shot obviously you can skip chapter one entirely and just go immediately into essentially hunting down the gang and going into the mine that's a really neat option because a lot of one shots can get bogged down in that initial quest giving uh, scenario, whereas you're very much uh, you know strapped for time and you just want to get the players into the action as quickly as possible. Uh, that being said, you would actually miss one of the better parts of this adventure, which is of course the town of Mud. It features a lot of colorful characters: Rot Gut, the half orc barkeep. Uh, there's Galen, the uh, dark elf sheriff, and her. Uh, uh, deputy named Deputy Horse, who is a giant mastiff, and my favorite character, who is the uh, trader, uh, kind of runs like the gray market uh, goods, which is a cigar chomping goblin named Satchel. Absolutely amazing, and, and all of this I was really excited. Like, yes, I like these characters. You know, there's the bank, there's the little jail cell, there's uh, somebody who's down on their luck because you know their uh, family's been taken over by the bandits, and it's just. All of this stuff was making me really excited. You know, there's a corrupt foreman. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I was totally on board with this. And I think the side quest, which we're given one basic side quest before you can tackle the mine, although players could skip it entirely if they wanted to, ends up being better than the main quest because it's the classic, you know, enemy gang, which is a, a huge trope, effective one for Westerns. In this case, um, led by an Asimir and... There's a neat tie-in with the gang and the villain. Uh, the gang leader wears a amulet that marks them as uh, basically tied to a death lock, which there's a little bit of a backstory about this uh, tiefling that I think was the former mayor of the town, uh, became corrupted, uh, was apprenticed to a lich, and then um, is a death lock trying to uh, complete the ritual of creating their phylactery and putting the soul in the phylactery. A deathlock, by the way, is from Mordenkainen's Tomb of Foes and is basically a mini baby lich. It's, you know, liches are, of course, 
way high up there in, in the CR rating and, and pretty much high level threats. And a Deathlock is an excuse to use like a CR 4 or 5 Lich or something. Uh, so, you know, a solid villain for an adventure. Um, it doesn't unfortunately have much in the way of villain development or any side, you know, any storytelling in that regard, which is a bummer. Instead, the villain basically has two mini bosses or minions, and then those minions can actually um, have power over creating zombies. One of them is the gang leader, and the other one is the foreman, whom you thought was had just basically fucked off and, and left town, uh, and is in fact uh, has been conscripted by the villain. And when you rescue him in the mine, it's even supposed to be a uh, a quandary for the players to figure out. Wait, are you? You know, and he, of course, oh, I was forced to do this. And then you, you, the things you've learned could be that you know that he's actually just a henchman who maybe has second thoughts about working with a Deathlock, and maybe he won't be granted eternal life. Uh, but the I love the gang leader thing because that means the gang leader has access to zombies. So half the gang is you know people with six. Which yes, there are guns in this one. They're pepper boxes. They're very rudimentary, and and you know the the DMG even has um, rules for firearms. That's not even that crazy of a thing, and I think it obviously fits very well here. So half of of bandits that are sitting back shooting, and the other half are just zombies that are get, that are unleashed upon the players. That's a neat makeup for um, a bandit group and i love that uh y you can encounter them either via a ambush on the road which means obviously the gang can surprise you and that's pretty much the only encounter or or you could even combine that if you wanted to fight a little bit and have them retreat there's also their own uh layer of they, they've taken over this farm so it's a neat encounter i like the gang leader um and they are tied to the final boss via these amulets the weird thing is if you destroy the gang leader um then the amulet is destroyed as well and that actually powers up the villain so in a weird way the players um defeating these mini bosses helps the villain <laughs> which i thought was kind of a bizarre turn and the players would really have no way of, of figuring that out uh and in fact the the second one whom they find literally in the penultimate room of the adventure uh, he can immediately power up the villain because he can just run back to the villain and the villain can suck his life force out or whatever. So it's kind of a weird turn that completing these events and successfully, you know, defeating this gang actually helps the villain in the end. You'd think it would be the opposite effect. So I thought that was a little bizarre. But I like the, you know, rival gang thing. I wish I wish all of this was longer. I wish there was way more to do in the town. I wish the town was more fully fleshed out. I wish the characters had more... Uh, information about them. I wish this gang was a multi-step adventure. I just wanted more here, especially after reading the entire adventure, because I thought the mine, which is unfortunately the main part of this adventure, is not that exciting. So, the haunted mine uh, really ends up being just a straightforward undead dungeon crawl. It's not bad, by the way. We we do get maps. Uh, these are we get maps that are slightly better looking than this they have like essentially it looks like a dyson logos map and then somebody uh threw a bunch of like color assets on it so they're not like redone and given textures or anything but they are given some color uh and and improved somewhat to where i uh let's see what's like this is a good example of this this is the final boss's chamber uh i am not going to include it on either a con or a pro i will say that uh, i think this is a good way of improving the map quality, but obviously it's still not a great looking map. Um, I don't want to complain too much because I appreciate that extra work was done to make this more than just a uh, you know black and white plain map. Um, but it's still without any kind of like you know floor texture and just kind of a grid. It's still not that attractive for a VTT. So I will give it kind of a middling like okay, thank you for at least putting the work in and and making it look very much better. So I won't put it as a con or anything, but. I'm not going to necessarily uh, effuse praise upon the map design either. But So looking at this dungeon, there are specters outside. Um, you're supposed to be, the DM is supposed to be attacking the players with zombies throughout, which zombies are fine. They're not the most exciting enemies. They're very overused, same as skeletons in terms of tier one, uh, you know, adventure design. It's just, you really can't like survive out of your low levels without having to kill at least one zombie or one skeleton. So it's a bummer that they're used quite a bit here. At least towards the end when you're actually fighting the villain, uh, there is an option to raise different kinds of zombies, which I appreciate that. But throughout this part, it's mainly just zombies. There's one kind of cool room, although it's completely optional, where uh, it's filled with water and like a gray ooze and an ochre jelly will drop down to attack. So I appreciate that as a little bit of a breakup. 
Uh, otherwise, they have to make their way through like a little bit of a cave-in, and then they deal with the uh, the foreman, which is supposed to be pretty much the only social scene that you've got since defeating the gang and entering the mine. And it's basically a minion of the villain uh, who he's you know tries to trick you and say, oh, I was just a unwilling, you know, I was forced to do this, and meanwhile, you know, I was got a bunch of zombies around him and everything, and he's working on creating more. And the players can choose what they want. Now, for all of these battles, we are given tactics, which is really quite helpful. All of these yellow sidebars um, dictate how the DM should run each battle, which as somebody who, uh, one of my biggest weaknesses as a DM is is tactically running battles, which is ironic because I play tactical strategy games all the damn time. Uh, but it can still be a lot, especially if you've got, you know, spellcasters and you're thinking about how to you know concoct a good story and everything and then once battle actually starts you're maybe not running things as um as efficiently as you could and so i really appreciate whenever designers add a tactics information in there to let me know how should i run this fight how how will these enemies try to go and what are the motivations for the villain in terms of what's really helpful here for example is uh at one point will they run away or change tactics or do something else for example that gang boss has an ability where uh, they can enter this kind of necrotic mode where these cool wings sprout out and they do different damage when they get to half health. That's really cool. Uh, so I do appreciate that we're given all these very, very helpful tactic sidebars, including for the final boss fight. Now, you know, it's fine. The Deathlock is, is a neat enemy. Um, it's obviously, it's a very linear dungeon, as you can see. There's a little bit of exploration here. You could end up at a side room which has nothing in it or fight the oozes, but generally you're just going to be going north. You're going to meet the uh, the foreman who's probably going to be a fight or he'll run away and, and help the boss. And then it's the boss room. There's not a lot of, yeah, like, yes, it's a dungeon. You're automatically going to kind of check that explorations uh, box, but it's really pretty linear. Um, the final area has the Deathlock in a ritual in which uh, they are slowly trying to convert their, or trying to move their soul into a phylactery. There's an interesting bit where they're in this circle which I assume it's a five foot grid map and it says they're not supposed to move from the circle. So you can see that people have to stand kind of in the circle to attack the Deathlock. And the reason that matters is because they take damage anytime they attack. Uh, the ritual circle itself will attack any creature passing over or through it. Well, does that include you're like attacking through it or how does it, cause the circle is not big enough from what I can tell in terms of you wouldn't ever have to move through it. So I was a little confused about the rules there Plus, what happens if you just knock this dude out of the circle, which a lot of people have abilities to do that, especially at level four, you know, you could, or you could just grab, you know, grapple them and, and shove them outside or do whatever. It doesn't say anything about, does that interrupt the ritual or how does that work? There is a cool thing where during this fight, because a deathlock really isn't that, I mean, a CR4 versus a bunch of fourth level players, it's, the math doesn't usually work out that way. Like you need extra minions or layer actions or something if you want to actually have a, a challenging boss fight like you can't just look at the cr that's one of the biggest things i've learned from years and years of DD is it just the action economy will kill you every time thankfully what happens here is that skeletons continually spawn in the room starting on round one a the homunculus which is like the deathlock's familiar flies around and scatters teeth in a very much a nod to the old ray harryhausen uh the the jason the argonauts with the teeth uh, creating skeletons popping out. That's really cool. However, what happens if somebody takes out that homunculus? Homunculus only have like five hit points. They're just little familiars. There's no information about that that I can see. If somebody just snipes that homunculus out of the sky and the bag of teeth falls to the ground, does that stop the skeleton summoning? Because that would be the obvious thing for any player to do when you first see that happening. It doesn't mention the fact that uh, that, that changes anything or stops the Like what happens if they take it out? So. I, I liked the setup for this final boss encounter, but I feel like it needed more information for these problems and contingencies that even I'm coming up with just after, you know, looking over it and thinking about the kind of things my players would do in terms of how the circle works, the action economy, and then this homunculus being the one that's actually summoning the skeletons and not have it just be an automatic thing happening every round. I mean, I like the visual of the creature doing that, but you have to... You have to then add to the fact that like, oh, well, immediately one of the players is going to pull out a bow or shoot it or do something to knock this thing down and kill it and then not summon any more skeletons every single round. Uh, and it only mentions in the text like, hey, if you want to use ad additional different kinds of skeleton stat blocks, you can. It suggests using wolf skeletons every uh, once in a while or dire wolf or lion or something, which I would definitely do because that's cool. 
Uh, and it mentions if you want to give the Deathlock legendary resistance or layer actions, you can do that. Well, just do that. Like, make the Deathlock have those things because if you've got level four players, it's not going to be a big enough fight. Sorry, he's only got 30 some hit points. Like, it's just, it's not going to last very long. Um, granted, if, if the players don't have magic weapons, then they're going to be a little more dire straits, but still. I'm always looking at that in terms of the balancing in your boss fights. Uh, what does the action economy look like? And with the skeletons, that definitely helps. But still, uh, I feel like you're, really all bosses need to have some kind of legendary resistances or layer actions. Even at low levels, you could still make use of that. So it just ends up being a little too generic because you could pick up this entire cave as is and put it in a non-Western themed adventure and it plays out the exact same. So... I was disappointed that we got such a hard theming with the Western thing, right? Like it, like the 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 dialogue, the read aloud text is all like rootin' tootin', like let's get us a varmint and all that, and the text is done in that Western font, and the the sepia tone pages and the town and the people in the town, like all of that does such a good job of evoking the Western theme, and then it just falls apart with this dungeon, which doesn't really do that at all. It, I mean, the mine miners turning into you know, zombies and ghosts, like, that happens in D&D all the time, that doesn't, re that doesn't really scream Western to me, so I thought that the focus on a, you know, undead mine filled with zombies and stuff, and even the, the, uh, just a, a death lock, like, transporting their soul into a phylactery, like, none of that is Western-y, and, and I get wanting to do the weird Western thing, that's cool, I definitely do supernatural or horror Western, absolutely do that, but this, you, you have to take another step, because it's just, that's just D&D, baby, <laughs> so there's not enough I, I just didn't get enough of that theming, I guess. So I was disappointed because I really liked the first uh, two chapters, I guess it is, and the, uh, or actually I guess the first, is the first chapter? Yeah, I guess the first chapter includes the, the side quest. So the other chapters are the uh, actual uh, layer, the Deathlock layer. As a, as a Deathlock layer, it's fine, but I just don't think it does the Western theming well enough for me. All right, pros and cons for a town called Mud, the Haunted Mine. Pros, option to skip chapter one with a summary for a faster paced one shot. I think all short adventures should do that. That's a really good idea. And the way it does it is that, you know, it's got multiple adventure hooks. And one of the hooks is that your characters win the, the deed to the mine in a card game. And you can just explain that in a paragraph uh, that your players made it to this town or, or whatever they are. And they won this mine in a card game. And then you've got the deed to the mine, so you need to go check out the mine. And that's how it leads to the mine. So that's a really easy way of doing that. And I think that's a pretty effective way of, of running a one-shot if you wanted to skip it. <laughs> the, the bad side is I think the town is actually probably one of the best parts of this adventure. Pro enemy gang is half zombies and can be encountered via a road ambush or at their hideout. I really like the, the uh, gang. Uh, I think it's just a, a very well done staple of the Western and I like that there's options to uh, uh, hit them up at a road encounter or at their own lair or both if you wanted to and they have kind of a neat tie into the Deathlock even though that dungeon ends up being disappointing to me. Pro suggested tactics for each combat encounter, huge plus, uh, always appreciate seeing how to actually run a fight. And Pro, uh, the layout and design very nicely evokes that Western theme. I thought that was really cool, and it made me very excited uh, to uh, see how that theme was utilized. Unfortunately, the con is uh, the mind evolves into a generic undead cave with an underdeveloped villain. Um, it's fine. It's not super memorable or fantastic in terms of a dungeon crawl. Um, I don't have any big complaints about how it's designed necessarily, except for the fact that I was really expecting more. I was expecting it to evoke that Western theme and be able to use those elements more. Maybe, you know, if the gang was there hiding out or something and it just happens to be, you know, there's a, a ritual somewhere in the back, like that would have tied together things a lot nicer. So uh, I think because I was expecting more of that Western theme, the, the dungeon ended up being a lot more disappointing to me in the end. Final verdict, with the promise of a fun western theme, The Haunted Mine is a disappointingly straightforward dungeon crawl that serves as a decent, if unremarkable, deathlock layer. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com. You can watch more reviews and follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. And you can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shoutouts to Platinum Patrons, Joe, Will, Tiny Dancer, Manuel, Wizard, Princess, Christopher, Thomas, Captain Mike, Adam, Aiden, Instant Loose, Roger, Stan, Nathan, and Alex. And Gold Patrons, RPG, Papercrafts, Charming Grenade, Pretty Boy, and Yuma, Marco, State, Vicente, Gilberto, Dead Lizard, Lion, Sam, Ross, Limpy Spuds, Jerome, Fatboy, 619, Scalene, Nick, Party, McButterfans, Blood, Angel, Bruno, Baboon, Baboon, Nathan, and Fast Like a Tortoise. Thank you all very much for your support.